Uh, hello and uh, welcome uh, to tonight's event. I'm Mark Marius Smith, the manager of the Kasten Centre. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Zunes uh, to you tonight. Um, he's here to discuss the extraordinary events that have uh, rolled across the Middle East over the past 18 months. Uh, we always feel privileged to be able to uh, host someone as, as eminent as Professor Zunes, and particularly on a, a topic of such global and immediate importance. Um, Professor Zunes is a professor of politics and inter and and that's better. That's, better. <laughs> that's better, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Um, uh, for, uh, he's professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, uh, where he chairs the program in um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, studies. Uh, he served as, serves as Senior Policy Analyst uh, for the Foreign Policy and Focus Project of the Institute for Policy Studies uh, as an Associate Editor of Peace Review and a Contributing Editor of Tikkun. Uh, in addition to his many scholarly and general articles on Middle Eastern politics, US foreign policy, international terrorism and many other issues, uh, Professor Zunes is the Principal Editor of Nonviolent Social Movements, uh, the author of the highly acclaimed uh, Tinderbox, US Middle East Policy and the Roots of Terrorism, and co-author with Jacob Mundy of Western Sahara War Nationalism and Conflict Irresolution. Uh, in 2002, he won recognition for the Peace and Justice Studies Association as their first Peace Scholar of the Year. Uh, he's made frequent visits to the Middle East and other conflict regions where he's met with top government officials, uh, journalists, academics and opposition leaders, and he serves as a consultant and a board member for a number of human rights and peace organisations. So please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Zunes to the lectern. Thank you. It's a, pl it's a pleasure being uh, uh, back here in, in, in Melbourne. I <coughs> it's, it's interesting to, to look back at just a little over a year ago if uh, you were to base your understanding uh, of the Middle East on what one normally had heard from the, from the uh, Western media, uh, the struggle for the region was uh, between two extremes. You had Al-Qaeda and related groups that tried to convince people the only way to overthrow uh, these Western-backed dictatorships uh, was through violence, uh, through terrorism, and embracing their reactionary, apocalyptic uh, uh, version of Islam. Uh, Indeed, Al-Qaeda's first attack uh, against uh, U.S. interest was back in 1995 uh, against a residential compound in, 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 near Riyadh used by uh, U.S. soldiers responsible for training the Saudi National Guard, uh, the branch of the Saudi military used for internal repression. The line put forward by Osama bin Laden and like-minded self-styled jihadists had, had long been you know, that, 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 that this is a way to, uh, to, to defeat these U.S.-backed dictatorships. But the reality is you know, none of these groups had ever come close to overthrowing the more than uh, two dozen U.S.-backed uh, dictatorships in the Islamic world. On the other extreme, uh, you had uh, American neoconservatives, their supporters, who tried to convince people that the only way uh, uh, dictatorships uh, could, could be overthrown uh, and, and bring democracy is through invasion and occupation, you know, such as the, uh, the war on, on Iraq. But of course in Iraq we see a sectarian Shia regime, uh, widespread torture and killings of suspected regime opponents, silencing opposition journalists, um, uh, suppressing pro-democracy protests, shutting down um, uh, offices of pro-democracy groups, and not to mention the fact that uh, Trans, uh, Transparency International is named the Iraqi government as one of the five most corrupt uh, governments uh, in, in the world. Um, hardly uh, the kind of democracy that, that Middle Eastern uh, countries or anybody else would really want to emulate. And Indeed, this is the kind of so-called democracy that, that results when a dictatorship is overthrown through foreign military intervention. Indeed, I've argued that the claim that the invasion of Iraq was necessary to bring democracy was as big a lie as the claim that Iraq had somehow miraculously reconstituted its so-called weapons of mass destruction. Um, the, the, yet, yet we were led to believe these are the only choices. Uh, in Bush's words, you're either with us or with the terrorists. But uh, the, 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 the pro-democracy struggles that have swept 
the Arab world in the past year uh, have, have, um, have proven that, that both of these extreme views were wrong. Instead, it is demonstrated that the most successful path to change in the Middle East, of empowering civil society and ousting dictatorship, giving at least some hope for democratic rule, is through the power of strategic nonviolent action. This is the same force that brought down dictators like Marcos in the Philippines, Pinochet in Chile, the, the communist regimes in Poland, East Germany, and Czechoslovakia, uh, the autocr autocratic monarchy in Nepal, apartheid in South Africa, uh, Milosevic in Serbia, uh, Ratsaraka in Madagascar, uh, the military dictatorship in Bolivia, and, and scores of others. Uh, in, in, indeed, uh, a study uh, that came out in 2005 and observed that of the nearly 70 countries that have made the transition from dictatorship to some form of democracy over the past few decades, only a small number did so through armed struggle from below or reform instigated from above. Hardly any new democracies resulted from foreign invasion. In nearly three quarters of the transition, the study found that change was rooted in democratic civil society organizations that employed nonviolent methods. A different study, uh, originally uh, uh, published in, a, in an academic journal in 2007, which just came out in book form um, a few months ago from Columbia University Press, used an expanded database that looked at 323 major insurrections in support of self-determination and democratic rule since 1900. And it found that violent resistance was successful only 26% of the time, whereas primarily nonviolent campaign had a 53% rate of success. So, so why is the fact that uh, people in Arab countries employed similar methods come as such a surprise? Uh, you know, some, of course, would argue that somehow it's not in their culture. But in reality, uh, there's a long history of nonviolent resistance in the Middle East, including Egypt's 1919 uh, independence struggle against the British. Iran has had a long history of such uprisings, such as the tobacco strike in the 1890s, the Constitutional Revolution in 1906, the overthrow of the Shah in 1979, and the aborted Green Revolution uh, three years ago. Palestine has, has witnessed the general strike in the 1930s, the first intifada in the late, late, late 1980s, and more recent uh, uh, campaigns against the uh, separation wall and settlement expansion in the West Bank. In Sudan, unarmed insurrections ousted military dictatorships in both 1964 and 1985, though the democratic uh, governments that followed were unfortunately uh, uh, overthrown in military coups a few years later. The 2005 Cedar Revolution in Lebanon entered years of Syrian domination of that country. And there's also been ongoing nonviolent resistance uh, in the uh, occupied nation of Western Sahara against the um, uh, illegal uh, Moroccan uh, takeover of that country. Other uh, Muslim nations have witnessed successful unarmed insurrections against dictatorships, include the 1991 revolution against the Traore dictatorship in Mali. Uh, the resistance struggle in the Maldives, which forced the Gayoom regime to hold free elections, which they ended up losing. Uh, the uprising against General Rashad in Bangladesh in 1991, and the 1998 uh, overthrow of General Suharto in Indonesia. And one of the great strengths we find in Islamic uh, cultures, which can be found in Hadith and the, the words of the early caliphs and in much Islamic uh, scholarship subsequently, is, is that while legitimate leaders should be respected, people have the right to resist any ruler that is unjust. And such a decision to refuse one's cooperation with illegitimate authority it, it is a crucial step in building a nonviolent resistance movement that can, can bring down a regime. Because this is, this is non-cooperation, yeah, which is ultimately uh, you know, what can bring down uh, dictators. Dictators are only as strong as people's willingness to obey them. So this idea that, that Muslim peoples are either passive collaborators with oppression uh, on one hand, or, or crazed terrorists 
lashing out any, any kind of authority on another. It's completely ahistorical. So, so who is responsible you know, for the ouster of dictators in, in Yemen and Tunisia and Egypt? <coughs> it was millions of ordinary Arabs. Men and women, Christian and Muslim, young and old, workers and intellectuals, poor and middle class, you know, secular and religious. I mean, who, ordinary people who face down the truncheons, water cannons, bullets, and goon squads for their freedom. It was not the militaries that were responsible. I mean, Egypt, for example, some top you know, military officers did push uh, Mubarak aside on February 11th, but that was more of a coup de grace than a coup d'etat. I mean, they, I, I, they, they don't doubt, don't doubt uh, recognize that if they, um, if they didn't uh, um, end up um, uh, easing him out, they'd be taken down with him. Uh, the army's refusal to engage in a Tiananmen Square-style massacre in Tahrir Square came not because the generals were on the protester's side. Indeed, they'd for years been the bedrock of Mubarak's regime. Mubarak was head of the Air Force, remember, before he, he, he became uh, Sadat's vice president and then president. Uh, but because they could not trust their own soldiers disproportionately from the poor and disenfranchised sectors of society to obey orders to fire on their own people. Similarly, Ben Ali fled Tunisia, not because the military ordered him to do so, but when they told him that they would be unable to carry out his orders to gun down the hundreds of thousands of protesters that had massed on Burguiba Avenue in, in violation of, of, of the curfew. Now, it was not in the United States, you know, long the primary backer of the Mubarak regime and major supporter of Ben Ali and, 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 and of Salah, you know, who were responsible for these uh, dictators leaving. In fact, the Obama administration played catch-up during uh, most of these uprisings. Uh, in the early days, uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton and others uh, defended uh, US's, or the United States' close ties with uh, the authoritarian rulers, made, uh, then made some leak, lukewarm uh, statements about the need for reform within the regimes and urging both sides to refrain from uh, um, violence, despite the far greater violence from, from authorities. And they refused to openly back the pro-democracy movements. They refused to uh, directly, um, uh, you know, call, uh, you know they, they refused to, to, to suspend uh, U.S. Uh, military aid. Obama's strongest and most eloquent words in support of the pro-democracy struggles came only after the dictator's departures giving a sense that it became more of a desire not to be on the wrong side of history than a desire to play the role of catalyst. But, but these shifts illustrate, I believe, that despite the long-standing sense of fatalism that, that you've often found in, in, in Arab countries, that Washington will ultimately impact what happens on the so-called Arab street, that the Arab street has proven itself incapable of impacting what happens in Washington. Now, this change is long overdue. I mean, the Obama administration, in um, rejecting the dangerous neoconservative ideology of its predecessor, had fallen back into kind of the realpolitik of, of previous administrations by, by continuing to support repressive regimes through unconditional arms transfers and other security assistance. Indeed, Obama's understandable skepticism of the neoconservative doctrine of externally mandated, uh, top-down uh, approaches to democratization through regime change uh, of governments we didn't like turned into uh, an, an excuse uh, to, um, to not take a very proactive uh, role in supporting, uh, supporting democracy, but that you know, by providing security assistance and, and, and essentially instruments of repression, it enabled these regimes to suppress and subjugate popular indigenous bottom-up struggles for democratization. Now Bush, you know, of course, called for spreading democracy in his words from Damascus to Tehran. And while I think we can all agree that um, Syria and Iran could use more, use more democracy, um, it's interesting he did not um, call for spreading democracy from Tunis to Cairo or to Sana'a, or Riyadh, or Manama, or Muscat, or Rabat, or Amman, or, or any of the capitals of allied dictatorships. Indeed, Bush provided more support to more dictatorships in the greater Middle East, North Africa region than any previous president. Uh, despite this, uh, in the media, in the period leading up to the invasion of Iraq, I was repeatedly asked by the media 
whether I supported the old policy of unconditional support for dictatorships or I supported Bush's policy of promoting democracy by military force, as if these were the only two choices. Um, indeed, I, I, Bush did for democracy in the Middle East what Stalin did for socialism in Eastern Europe. Uh, I mean, he ended up associating these ideals with invasion, occupation, and repression. And by using democracy uh, as a cover for an illegal and unnecessary war and occupation, uh, which resulted in an enormous anti-American and anti-Western backlash throughout the region, it made it difficult for the U.S. government to more openly support pro-democracy struggles. Um, uh, because, uh, you, know, you know, regimes uh, were able to use in 89, uh, other successful pro-democracy movements that took place in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, and elsewhere. You know, they didn't have access to internet technology as we know today. In fact, in Mali, you know, which is an impoverished, uh, um, landlocked African country, the, the news of their eventually successful 1991 uprising against the dictatorship there was spread through brios. You know, the traditional singing storytellers that would wander from village to village. So, so my point is, is that um, when people are committed to struggle, um, they'll find ways to, to communicate. And, and also, I, I've seen some people emphasize WikiLeaks, and, 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 uh, uh, because the, 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 the leaked cables um, exposed how you know, U.S. diplomats were well aware of the corruption and repression in some of these uh, uh, regimes and, and the propensity of these regimes to deliberately exaggerate the influence of radical Islamists in the opposition. Uh, but such malfeasance of those governments were already known by the people in those countries. I mean, it was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing really new there uh, that, that could, could inspire. Um, and and nor, nor was the success um, of these movements uh, a result of, of, of the, 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 um, uh, the assistance or training by outsiders. There were, a, in the case of Egypt, there were a couple of seminars organized by Egyptian pro-democracy groups that brought in veterans of popular unarmed insurrections in, in Serbia, South Africa, and Palestine, and other countries, along with some Western academics who studied the phenomenon. But these seminars uh, focus on generic information about the history and dynamics of strategic nonviolent action. Uh, these were not workshops on how to overthrow Mubarak. Um, neither the foreign speakers nor their affiliate institutions provide any training, advice, money, or anything tangible to the relatively small number of, Egy of Egyptian activists that attended. I know because I was one of the academics that were, were part of these, and, and, and uh, um, I, 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 I lectured at these things, and I, and, and, into the, and I actually, I'm, I'm not making this up, I found uh, things on the internet that claim that I was responsible for the Egyptian revolution. <laughs> Um, that, that like, and, and let, me, let me tell you, I'm not a Lawrence of Arabia, okay? Uh, these people were perfectly capable, and part of it was that I was one of the few people who actually predicted the Egyptian revolution. I said, aha, how do you know that? You know, I, but I knew it, I, I, I had a sense it was coming because I had witnessed there and other trips this dramatic growth of civil society, uh, the increase in labor strikes, the increase of, uh, of activist groups. The Egyptians are already thinking about these things and how to do this. They've been inspired by Serbia and these other places. And they had read Gene Sharp, who was uh, a leading theorist of, of um, strategic nonviolent action, and the New York, uh, New York Times article you know, tries to credit him for it, but uh, 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 Gene himself doesn't take credit for it. I mean, yes, they read Sharp, they also read Gramsci, they also read a lot of other people that, that may have had some influence. But again, the, 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 the point here is that, it's and the reason I'm going over these various uh, um, non-explanations, because I think it's critical that we not deny agency to, an Arab, to Arab peoples who had the courage and the smarts and, and, and the tenacity to organize and fight their own nonviolent revolution. In fact, I think it's somewhat racist to assume that you need to have these white guys, you know, or white thinkers or white anything, you know, <laughs> to come in and, 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 tell them, and, and tell them what to do. Because you know that, like, you know, it is many ways a mirror image of the uh, you know claims during the Cold War that every Third World Revolution was a plot hatched in Moscow. You know that um, that these these are very much homegrown um, 
homegrown uh, phenomenon, and we need to to uh, to uh, respect that. Uh, the next uh, thing I, I want to turn to is just looking at some of the individual countries uh, that they that uh, you know Egypt. Um, we know the military has held on to power and has been suppressing the, the pro-democracy uh, struggle there. They did allow elections, where Islamist groups did uh, surprisingly well. Uh, and uh, the and then unfortunately, the the uh, lack of experience in electoral politics and canvassing related political skills by the uh, young secular revolutions became apparent. And these uh, older and, and better organized Islamist groups did very well. The, the Egyptian military. Uh, with, uh, supported them by allowing them to violate certain uh, election rules, you know, like uh, passing out pre-printed, uh, you know, ballots, um, uh, sample ballots in line, and, and a bunch of other things. Uh, they cracked down the offices of the, of the, of the liberal pro-democracy group by allowing millions of dollars from the Gulf to come and flow in and support the Islamists. I think part of the strategy is to to make Egyptian Christians and secularists and leftists and other moderates and as well as foreign governments to say, oh, if the Egyptian military gives up power to uh, the parliament, uh, the Islamists are going to take over and we can't allow that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, and, but despite the, the, the apparent Islamist and, and military alliance in, in Egypt, I, I, and while, while I'm not very hopeful in that country in the short term, um, I, I am hopeful in the longer term um, because, again, there's been this dramatic growth in Egyptian civil society. Um, the, the, uh, the, these people have been empowered by last year's revolution. They recognize that ultimately power rests not with the military, Islamist politicians, other elites, with, with, the, peop with the people themselves. I mean, I remember being in a, a, a cafe in, in Cairo a few months ago and the news was on. And if you watch, ever watch the news in Egypt and, and most uh, Islamic countries, or sorry, most Arab countries, it's usually a, a situation where the, the president, the news, news consists of the president giving a speech, the president meet, uh, meeting a visiting foreign dignitary, the uh, president visiting the widget factory, or whatever. Everything is about the president. But, but turning on the news this time, the news is about a labor strike in Cairo, relatives of the martyrs having a vigil outside the, the interior ministry. The ongoing uprising in Yemen, the ongoing uprising in Syria. Who is making the news now? Who are the newsmakers? I think that alone, I think, shows there has been a shift. That uh, that people that is there, they are no longer being passive victims. That they realize that they are ultimately, ultimately, uh, you know, leaders in in their. Uh, they are the makers of history. That they, they they are in charge of their own destiny. The sense of again fatalism that we've seen so much in the Arab, Arab world is it, dissipated. And this is new a new generation. Six percent of Egyptians are under thirty years old. You know, so you know, we are we're seeing a, a, a you know, dramatic growth in a um, in, in a, a, a in a new a new, a new generation that uh, is, is not does not uh, see the future in the military or in a dictator or a conservative Islamist, but again, in their, in their own hands. And that's why uh, you know, the, the things are very frustrating when you look at uh, Egypt, and I'm not optimistic in the short term. I do believe in the long term we will see a more democratic and just um, uh, Egypt. Uh, and another, another country that's been um, struggling a bit, of course, has been Yemen. Uh, but even in Yemen, uh, despite many problems there, uh, Salah has has left. Uh, so his his vice his handpicked vice president is is now the president. A lot of the old, old guard remain. Uh, there are there are some there are some changes afoot. Uh, we have um, what was most uh, remarkable about that revolution in many ways is that uh, you know some people say oh, oh these people use nonviolent action mm -hmm. and because they are um, you know they didn't have the um, um, didn't have the guns, so you can't say that about Yemen. <laughs> Yemen has more guns per capita than any country in the world. I mean, I, I, it's, it's barely an exaggeration to say that virtually every every uh, every male fifteen dollar has a Kalashnikov. Um, it's uh, uh, but you know there are, there are these scenes of like the, these um, tribesmen you know, coming in on horseback into town, you know, with their automatic rifles and these um, um, contravia salbandieros, and you know. 
taking them off, throwing them on the ground, saying peaceful, peaceful, and then joining the uh, nonviolent protests. Uh, that in a country that's been ravaged by sectarian fighting and, 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 and um, blood feuds and <laughs> tribal war and, and civil war, in fact, it was two countries until fairly recently, um, you know, that, you know, e even there they are recognizing you know, the power of ordinary people and massive nonviolent resistance to, um, uh, uh, to create change. Uh, Tunisia is, is really, in many ways, the bright spot because Tunisia we have seen a situation where you have a moderate Islamist and leftist and traditional opposition parties and young revolutionaries and all these other elements of society coming together and, and, and hashing out a new constitution, really trying to build a more pluralistic uh, society. You, know, you have uh, freedom of the press. You know, there's a, a much more open process. And like any, any transition, it, is, it, it, it looks, looks difficult there. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, uh, it's looking, things are, are, are looking quite, quite positive. Uh, in Tunisia, it may be, 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 be a good model of where you know, much of the Arab world uh, will be going. I, I do want to address, t take a minute to address uh, um, Libya, because uh, some people would argue that all Libya is an example of how nonviolence does not work. But um, it's important to remember that the initial uprising against Gaddafi in February was overwhelmingly nonviolent. In less than a week, uh, this unarmed insurrection uh, succeeded uh, in, in pro-democracy forces taking over the eastern half of the country and many of the cities in the west. It was also during this period when the big defections took place of Gaddafi's top uh, aides and cabinet members, ambassadors overseas, uh, top uh, military uh, op uh, officers, and, 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 uh, and, and many hundreds and, and the, and the and, uh, uh, rank and file soldiers. Um, it was only when the rebellion took a more violent turn uh, that the revolution's progress was dramatically reversed and Gaddafi gave his infamous February 22nd speech threatening massacres and, and rebel strongholds which then in turn led to NATO uh, intervention. Uh, this then therefore then enabled Gaddafi to rally far more support to his side than he would have otherwise by taking advantage of the nationalist reaction to um, the uh, European North American attack on his country. And it's also important to note that the reason anti Gaddafi rebels were able to unexpectedly march into Tripoli in August with so little resistance, instead of the bloody and protracted final battle that many people expected, was that there was a massive and largely unarmed civil insurrection that had erupted in neighborhoods throughout the city. In other words, most of the cat in the, in the 24, 36 hours prior, to the uh, rebel columns moving in. So when the rebel columns finally did move in, much of the country had already been liberated and all they had to do really was to, was to, to, to mop up a few uh, remaining pockets of, uh, of, of pro-regime forces in Gaddafi's old compound and a couple other places. Now, I, I think Libya, unfortunately, does, is something of a cautionary tale in that what we've seen subsequently to Gaddafi's overthrow is the extrajudicial killing of Gaddafi and hundreds of his supporters. We've seen rival militias fighting each other for the spoils, you know, such as uh, the, the, who controls the airport in Tripoli and, and elsewhere. These arms caches have uh, gotten into hands of, of all sorts of, of crazy, crazy characters. And, and this is one of the problems with, with armed struggle, because in nonviolent resistance, in order for a, a civil insurrection to succeed, you need to build a kind of coalition you know, that, that, you know, that represents broad segments of society. You need to take advantage of your numbers, which brings, which requires the kind of a compromise and, and cooperation critical. And, 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 and mainly which creates a prototype of a pluralistic society that you want to come to the fore after the uh, autocratic regime is overthrown. By contrast, armed struggles, tend to be centered on an elite vanguard with strict military hierarchy and martial values, um, patterns of leadership which often continue once the rebel military commanders uh, become the new political leaders. <laughs> so su successful armed revolutions send the message that power comes through an ability to kill your opponent and destroy its assets. And this is why, and there, and there, and there are important exceptions in, in, in both directions, but in general, on average, Dictatorships overthrown by nonviolent 
insurrections usually become stable democracies within a few years. Whereas dictatorships overthrown by armed revolutions are much more likely to become new dictatorships, often with continued violence and chaos. And again, if you can compare the situation in Tunisia um, with, with its democratic evolution with the uh, you know, violence and chaos in neighboring Libya, I think it's actually a pretty good illustration of that point. Um, I also want, I finally want to, want to turn to Syria, um, a really tragic situation, uh, and, but also an inspiring one. I mean, indeed, I, I've studied this phenomenon, I'm, the, the Middle East is my regional expertise, I've studied the phenomenon of nonviolent revolutions in, in many other parts of the world. Uh, and I, I've never known people who have just shown so much courage and, and, and tenacity in the face of such overwhelming uh, repression. And the, and, and, uh, it's a, it's a very difficult situation because the uh, Assad regime does have a stronger social base than these other uh, other countries. It's not just a one-man rule. It's not just a single dictator. The Ba'ath Party has, has ruled you know the country you know, for well over 40 years. Um, you know they you know they, they have a cadre a cadre that infiltrated almost every aspect of society. You have minority groups that that uh, are supporting the regime because they feel protected and certain ways privileged, and they fear the, the Biden rule tactics of the regime have unfortunately been, been successful in a lot of ways. Uh, and it, it's a, um, so it's a very challenging situation, and, 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 uh, and here it's a case where you know, uh, soldiers have, have been quite willing to fire on to ar unarmed um, uh, uh, protesters. But um, it's, it's important to remember that in a nonviolent struggle, like in a, a armed guerrilla warfare, it will only succeed if the resistance uses appropriate strategies and tactics. I mean, a guerrilla army, for example, cannot expect instant success with a, by a frontal attack on, on the capital. They need to engage initially engage in hit and run tactics and low risk operations, take time to mobilize their base in peripheral areas uh, before they, they, they have any chance to defeat a well-armed military force uh, of the state. You can't use the same tactics on the same battlefield against a more heavily armed opponent and expect to win. Well, similarly, in nonviolent struggle, it may not make sense for a nonviolent movement to rely primarily on the tactic of massive street demonstrations in the early phases when you know the regime is capable and willing <laughs> to gun down people. Maybe you need to diversify your tactics. Maybe you need to emphasize more on on lower risk operations like general strikes, it will affect the economy, but you know, people can stay at home and not, not confront uh, the regime uh, directly. You need to understand your side's strengths and weaknesses, so the opponent's strengths and weaknesses, and, 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 and uh, analyze these and act accordingly. Uh, it's also important to, to, to realize that in any liberation struggle, you know, people are going to be killed when challenging an oppressive regime. But, but in general, nonviolent uh, struggles generally uh, 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 result in much fewer casualties. You know, soldiers and police are much less likely to shoot in the crowds of unarmed demonstrators than they're going to shoot in, shoot in the crowds of people shooting at them. Um, and you know, nearly 4,000 nonviolent uh, protesters were killed in Syria you know, during the nonviolent phase of, that, uh, of that, that uprising. But let's remember at least eight times that many died in the course of the uh, Libyan struggle in even a shorter period of time. Uh, the problem is that armed resistance, even for a just cause, can terrify people not yet committed to the struggle, making it easier for the government to justify violent repression and the use of military force in the name of protecting the population. Uh, the use of, uh, uh, use, the use of uh, force against unarmed resistance movements, on the other hand, usually creates greater sympathy for the government's opponents. In addition, unarmed campaigns involve a range, broad range of participants, far beyond young, able-bodied men normally found in the ranks of armed guerrillas. As the movement grows in strength, it can include a large cross-section of the population. And in, in addition, though most oppressive regimes are well prepared to deal with an armed insurgency, they tend to be less prepared to counter massive non-cooperation by the um, old, middle-aged, and young. And, 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 and to emphasize again, you know, when, when millions of people defy official orders by engaging in illegal demonstrations, going out on strike, 
uh, violating curfews, refusing to pay taxes, and otherwise refusing to recognize the legitimacy of the state, the state no longer has power. Another advantage is that pro-government elements tend to be more willing to compromise with nonviolent insurgents who are less likely to physically harm their opponents when they take power. You know, so, um, you know, if, if these people are, 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 are armed, heavily armed and, 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 and shooting your people, there's a theory, hey, if they win, I'm going to end up hanging from a lamppost. You know, but if, um, if they're nonviolent, you can face repression. Say, these people are rational, they're reasonable. If I defect, I, you know, maybe I'll be okay. And they will not fight to the bitter end as they might, um, might, might uh, uh, otherwise. And of course, unarmed movements are, are also increase the uh, likelihood of, of defections and non-cooperation from the police and, and military personnel, who again are, are more, generally more willing to fight in self-defense against armed guerrillas, but are hesitant to um, shoot into unarmed crowds. And, and since the Syrian movement has, has taken up arms, it, there are indications that the regime has consolidated its power in some key areas. Um, uh, when there, we're, we're starting to see more and more defections, uh, including from some economic elites and other people who are the backbone of the regime. It also gave Russia and China an excuse to veto what I considered a very modern and reasonable UN Security Council resolution, because they could say, oh, this is not a case of a, of a brutal dictatorship massacring its own people, it's a civil war. And what, what, what right does the UN have to take sides in a, in a, in a, in a civil war? I also want to bring up the question of this, the idea of, of a foreign intervention here. Um, the um, <clears throat> one thing Syria would be far more difficult than Libya. I mean, in Libya, everybody hated Gaddafi. I mean, he, he didn't lost. I mean, he didn't have virtually any support left at this point. Whereas, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Assad and his regime still has a, a, a social base, a minority at this point, but but still a, a fairly fairly sizable um, uh, minority. Uh, they, and, and the main problem, though, is, is the history of, of, of Western intervention in this part of the world. That, you know, that would lead, you know, inevitably to a strong nationalist reaction. People just don't trust that when people talk about the responsibility to protect, that, uh, that, that this is a, a, an example of liberal internationalism, but people fear it's, 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 it's an excuse for Western imperialism. Now, personally, I'm not opposed to the concept of responsibility to protect. But you, you, but you know, you can also understand uh, in extreme circumstances. But you can kind of understand the hesitancy and the concern, you know, that that many people uh, in former uh, colonial <laughs> situations have uh, about this concept. And and of course, you know, as many of you are aware, the the, the principal intellectual architect of the responsibility to protect is a, is a former Australian uh, foreign minister, Gareth Evans whom uh, you also know as foreign minister, was a supporter of the Indonesian regime at the time of the, of the repression in East Timor, which was far worse, far worse, uh, by quite a number of magnitudes of the repression we've seen in, in Libya and in, in Syria. Um, so, you know, again, there's not a lot of credibility here when, uh, uh, when you hear these statements. Now, as some of you may have heard, I had the temerity to point this out at a conference at the University of Melbourne a couple of days ago, with Gareth Evans present, he came charging over to me, started screaming a, a bunch of expletives, uh, grabbed my conference badge, tore it off, threw it in the ground, threatened to punch me in the face, and um, it, it was, it, was uh, he's, it sounds like he's a little sensitive about this, um, but, um, the, uh, but, you know, and, 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 and Gareth Evans has done, some, has done some good work in a lot of areas. I mean, I even used uh, his, his UN book as a, as a required text in my courses some, some, some years ago. But, you know, the, the East Timor thing is something of an albatross around his neck uh, and, and, and until he takes, uh, um, uh, 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 until he accepts responsibility for it, I, I, it's going to be a problem for him. And I think, but, 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 but I think in many ways it just uh, is emblematic of a bigger problem, you know, with the idea of Western intervention in, the, in these countries. Um, because um, the, um, the fact is, in terms of what the West can do, that the fundamental issue is that um, the, the vast majority of dictatorships in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world are armed by Western powers. I mean, I think, our, uh, you know, as in the Hippocratic Oath uh, for, for physicians, I think our, the, the, the mantra should be, uh, first, do no harm. 
I mean, before we even talk about intervening on behalf of pro-democracy forces, maybe we should stop supporting dictatorships. <laughs> that should be the priority. And indeed, I think it underscores that as much as I advocate uh, the, this, this idea of nonviolent resistance in the Middle East, the part of the world, the, the countries that, if you're really concerned about freedom and democracy in the Middle East, the countries that need nonviolent the, the mo resistance are the most are the United States, Britain, France, and other countries that continue to support dictatorships. Um, that um, the, um, but I, I, I want to, but, but, but the bottom line really is that um, even if a, a government has a monopoly of military force, and even if a government has the support of foreign powers, uh, like the United States and Britain and others, it is still ultimately powerless if people refuse to recognize its authority. That a ruler is only powerful as a people's willingness to obey. And the, um, because what we've seen is, 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 is from the poorest nations of Africa uh, to the relatively affluent countries of Eastern Europe, from communist regimes to right-wing military dictatorships, from across the cultural, geographical, and ideological spectrum, democratic and progressive forces have recognized the power of nonviolent action to free themselves from oppression. And this has not come, in most cases, from a moral or spiritual commitment to nonviolence, but simply because it works. Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King were great nonviolent uh, activists, and they were also spiritual pacifists. But they were the exceptions. They were the exceptions. The vast majority of, of leaders and participants in these nonviolent movements are, were not pacifists. We're not based on, 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 on a, a, a religious or spiritual commitment to nonviolence. They did so simply because they knew, they recognized, that it was a force more powerful than violence. And indeed, we are now seeing this phenomenon come to the Middle East to an unprecedented degree. And it underscores that, that democracy will not come to that region through foreign intervention, through sanctimonious statements from Washington or London or Canberra, from, will not come from voluntary reforms by autocrats or armed struggle by a self-selected vanguard, but from the people of the Middle East peoples of the Middle East themselves recognizing and utilizing the power of strategic nonviolent action. Thank you. Professor Zooms, um, I must apologize to you for um, my name's Sarah, I'm the director of the center and I was a little bit now, I think we've probably got about 10 minutes or so, so that would be okay. So are there any questions? Uh, there's, okay, there's uh, the man in the hat who was first and then way down the back. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for what was an incredibly informative talk. Um, people could wait till they get there. Oh, yeah, but thank you for what was an incredibly informative talk. Um, just one uh, other aspect, though, which I'd like you to address is like thinking back to the self immolation of Muhammad Wazizi in Tunisia, which is one of the things which people said sort of sparked the whole thing. A big aspect of the uprising seemed to be economic issues. I mean, specifically things like unemployment, lack of educational opportunities, lack of opportunities for people who were educated, and a lot of that seems to come from a global economic system enforced by institutions like the IMF and World Bank. And I guess what I was wondering is maybe specifically thinking of Tunisia, which as you pointed out on the political level, you know, seems to be the one looking most positive. But if these economic things aren't addressed, um, you know, do you think that there's a likelihood for lasting stable democracies? Mm -hmm. I, I, <clears throat> my, my impression is that, that uh, from talking with pro-democracy activists in these countries is that they, they see um, a democracy uh, almost uh, more of a means to an end than an end in itself, and that they, they see that, indeed, that economic justice, social economic justice is really, really key, and that just can't happen 
if you have a regime that is not transparent, that is not accountable, that it will, 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 will suppress uh, people's um, uh, basic rights, uh, that will give economic advantages to um, uh, crony capitalists and family members, not individuals, and will open up their country wide to exploitation uh, by foreign multinationals, international financial institutions. Um, indeed, in many respects, uh, this is much of a struggle against uh, neoliberalism than it is uh, one uh, and, and, and uh, against um, a, a dictatorship. I, I, I do believe, though, that um, you know, though, though my own um, you know, vision of a just society. You know, does uh, require you know, s uh, substantial challenges to the uh, current um, um, uh, corporate-dominated uh, neoliberal capitalist order. I, I, I believe that you know, first and foremost, to have uh, you know, civil and political rights are, are, are critical uh, in order to then make the more uh, radical changes for social and economic rights. You saw this in Latin America, that where. You had nonviolent movements in Chile and Bolivia, Argentina, Brazil, whatever, brought down these dictatorships uh, in the 1980s. You ended up with a um, with a series of, of, of center-right governments, which seemed to, you know, uh, you know basically merge their, their 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 companies, their countries to structural adjustment programs, the International Monetary Fund, etc. And and so they did not help the uh, social economic situation. In fact, made it worse in certain respects. However. Because you didn't have to worry about death squads, you didn't have to worry about uh, you know people coming in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, and hauling you away and disappearing you and that kind of thing. You, you had the ability, you know, for labor unions, for peasants' organizations, for the progressive church, um, you know, for for women, for human rights groups, for indigenous organizations, and others to mobilize and start demanding these kind of changes. And this, in turn, started to reflect itself in electoral politics, where we had, a, we had a whole series of victories by these left-leaning uh, political parties, which have started to address some of these social and economic issues. And so that's what I see eventually happening in, in the, in the uh, Arab world as well. Uh, my name is Ron Rosario, and uh, Stephen, I want to thank you. I really enjoyed that. Can you uh, slightly, perhaps slightly off topic, if you're talking about non-violent resistance, is it a good idea for the for the um, opposition group to separately call for outside the outside uh, world, say Western countries, etc., to go about um, with sanctions and target sanctions? I'm not sure how useful sanctions are. They were used in South Africa. Yeah. How important are they, and are they a good idea? Yeah. Um, it, it varies. I mean, in South Africa, they were quite critical. Uh, and uh, in, in some places they, they've been ended up being counterproductive because they ended up um, uh, making it uh, you know, more difficult for you know, civil society to to, to mobilize. Um, you know, clearly, if you have sanctions, you need to make sure they're targeted at uh, the regime, the regime supporters, and not at ordinary people. They often sanctions are, are done sort of almost punitively or in spite or out of frustration or out of catharsis or whatever. And you know, you need to think. And, and in terms of where and how sanctions are maybe appropriate, where where they are not, I think the lead should be taken by the opposition and the pro-democracy op opposition within the country because they know what the social forces and economic forces that are propping up the regime, and they know what, they have a pretty good idea of what might help and, and or hurt them, and might help or hurt hurt the regime, and, 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 and you know, take, take the lead from, they, they take the lead from them. Thank you very much. My name is Hashim Abdul Hamid from Monash Asia Institute. The fact that, that you acknowledge that Mahatma Gandhi back in 1947 started a non-violent struggle against the British and gained independence in India is very important as an example. But then we have to know the difference between the independence or sorry, the struggle for, for non-violent or was against the colonial power. Whereas among the Muslim countries in the Middle East, particularly beginning with the Arabic Spring or Samoa or whatever it's called, it is a different story. It is a struggle against an unjust national government. Mm -hmm. What is the difference in this? Uh, the difference between national struggles, you know, and um, and and ones against dictators, you know, are are. are, are, are um, 
it's primar primar primarily that you can, it's generally easier to, to um, you know, mobilize a broader segment of the population on your side because it is a national struggle. Uh, and often, you know, colonial power is even less familiar about what to do with those kinds of, of situations. There's less moral legitimacy. And in terms of, of uh, and, and, and of course, and, and, and uh, particularly in more recent times, uh, you know, colonialism is, is, is not acceptable in, in, in the world. And I'd say the same thing in military occupation. Uh, um, I think it's ultimately how um, East Timor is free because Australian civil society and American civil society and British civil society mobilized essentially into shaming their governments and to stopping to support uh, the, the occupation. So often it's easier in terms of occupation or anti-colonial struggles to get international you know, a, a solid solidarity. At the same time, it's not um, unusual for di dictatorships to be seen as, uh, there's some exceptions of course, but um, in many cases they're, 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 in certain ways they're neo-colonial <laughs> and uh, they're, they're kept in power because of their close uh, you know, support of the former colonial power or, or, or with the United States or, or, or other, other um, outsiders and, and people can, can uh, you know, use nationalist um, um, emblems and symbols and slogans uh, in, uh, in, as, as part, of, part of their struggle. And uh, and also just you know, kind of kind of uh, you know uh, that and, and also I, I I have the bias that while um, a, a country the form of democracy a country may take will vary depending on its unique history and culture that um, everyone wants to be free that, that that Muslims and Arabs don't like to be uh, uh, jailed tortured and murdered for their political beliefs any more than Western Christians do and and I, could, I think I could say this you know for virtually and, and every society so I think there are certain universal rights. You know, that can, that uh, people are willing to struggle for, whether they're being denied by a colonial power, or whether they're being denied by a homegrown dictator. I, I can say one. I want to say as long as people want. But uh, as long as rooms available, please. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your talk and how important it is to have some great scholarship in this area. Um, I was really interested in picking up your comment. Um, that countries ne that need nonviolent resistance the most are Western countries such as ourselves. And I'm wondering whether you can talk about the intersection between what are often mass movements um, for liberation and the role of kind of smaller civil disobedience actions in the West that I guess take more the, the form of a thorn, a, a thorn in the side or a stone yeah. in the shoe, mm -hmm. about what role you see those movements play. Well, I think that they're important because you know, even if they have limited goals, they they, they, they can help uh, you know, raise raise environmental uh, 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 raise greater awareness on broader issues. I mean, I think the Franklin River campaign, which uh, how many students study because it's such a classic um, that in terms of some of the uh, very uh, very and uh, tactically uh, it was brilliant and very well organized. You know, that not only preserve this, this incredibly you know, beautiful wilderness uh, area from destruction, but it, it did a lot, I think, uh, my impression is that it raised, did a lot to raise broader environmental uh, awareness uh, here in Australia, uh, which was a springboard for other, other victories uh, um, elsewhere. It also mobilized a grassroots community of activists, uh, of people who've gone on to, to be engaged in a whole bunch of other causes and struggles, not as dramatic, perhaps, as the, you know, Getting 1,400 people arrested and the, and the international tension that Franklin River did, but it did, it did, did, did uh, you know, you know, serve to to uh, you know to uh, to uh, to lead to um, you know uh, greater uh, cha uh, changes in, on the on environmental and a lot of other other issues. Of people who were empowered and politicized, you know, by the uh, by the experience. Because um, I think one of the the um, well, one of the dangers, if you will, of electoral democracy is that, 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 that people figure, oh, you, you vote every, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you're required to vote uh, you know, every, every few years, and that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's your, your, your political duty. And, and um, yes, it's you know, letter writing campaigns and lobbying and that kind of thing. It can, it can also be useful. But when you think about any real changes that have happened in society, or whether it be in terms of labor or the environment or, or women's rights or indigenous or, or, or rights of Aboriginal indigenous peoples or, or rights of of, of, of um, uh, you know, uh, you know, oppressed minorities, it's it's very very rare that you'll find a, a politician, even an enlightened one, who really leads the movement. Um, in most cases, uh, even relatively progressive parties. Uh, 
have to be, and their leadership have to be drag kicking and screaming by their uh, grassroots uh, to make change. And so I, I think it, it's really important to have this kind of, uh, to, 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 for, for people even in, in industrialized democracies to, to recognize the power of, of strategic nonviolent action uh, as a tool for change. Uh, because when you look at, I think, the history of most uh, Western democracies, it's, you know, that, that's really been the key key to most great uh, great social reforms that we now um, kind of you know, today take for granted. And you know, I, I think there's a, I think you know, those of us who tend to be sympathetic to these kinds of, of progressive struggles, I and mean, I think there's a tendency often to to um, to go on and on and try to educate people by telling them how bad things are and how how screwed up things are and how how bad the politicians are and, and, and things like that. And there's a, there's a place for that, but I, I think more importantly. People need to know the history of popular struggle. People need to hear about the victory, especially young people. To, 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 uh, you know, there's old generations growing up that, that, that don't know, they don't know, know what happened to Franklin River, or don't know about you know the the, uh, the, 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 the the campaigns for Aboriginal rights in the 60s and 70s, or all I mean the, the, the labor labor history in this country. I mean, there's so much <laughs> rich history. Here in Australia and other other countries, of these of, of, of popular struggles and popular victories, but you know these often don't get in the history books. You know, the, and, and, and people really really need to to, to, to know about them because uh, um, uh, because then, you know, pe yes, people need to be you know, a healthy skepticism about the system is, is is useful, but that could just lead to cynicism and apathy unless it's accompanied by people being empowered and excited. Uh, by the awareness of, of, of the victories uh, that, that, that the people power has had. Thanks very much. Um, thanks so much, Professor. It's great to have some scholarship about this. I agree with the last questioner. Um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about the responsibility to protect, because uh, mm -hmm. you did mention it. and. If what you say is true about Libya in the sense that um, building a, a case for a particular group to take, you know, leadership of a, a country post um, a crisis like what we saw um, is important, in what situations do you think R2P might be appropriate? Um, and, and especially given your comments as well about East Timor and the fact that there are obviously things that people can do in the heart of the beast to try and um, mm. uh, stop a humanitarian catastrophes occurring. Um, so, with that context, what what do you, what what is the role for it if it, if there is that power dynamic yeah. that's somewhat objectionable? It, it's hard. It's hard to say. I, I um. I mean. I. I mean. I, I mean. One when, when one situation where I think there really there should have been foreign military intervention, for example, is Rwanda in 1994. I think the, the genocide could have been prevented or stopped or stopped at a very early early phase had there been a decisive action. And uh, it's um, and so again, I, I don't, I don't, uh, don't rule it out. And again, I, my my interest in in, in uh, nonviolent action in general is not not because I'm a strict pacifist. I, I, I approach this more from a strategic studies perspective, essentially seeing it in many ways as the ultimate form of asymmetrical warfare. But you know, there are I, I can imagine other and, uh, and, and and so I don't, I don't make moral judgments against you know, people who feel they need to take up arms. But um, I you know the, the more I study. Uh, you know, the power of nonviolent action, how it works, you know, the, 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 the more enthusiastic I am about uh, a lot of situations, even where people say, you know, it's hopeless uh, to, to um, you know, to, that, that, um, that, you know, it was, it was not, it was not, again, not violence versus nonviolence, but it's, 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 again, you know, how, how do you, how do you, what's the most effective means of applying it strategically, tactically? But again, what about situations that, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, there is a slaughter going on and, and, uh, Foreign intervention could could uh, um, uh, prevent it. It's again, <laughs> there are uh, there 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 um, are situations. I, I don't have a fa I, I can't answer the question really. I can't, I can't think of a hard and fast rule. Again, I think there may be, um, and, and it's easy to look in hindsight where, you know, like in Rwanda, where it would have been would have been a good thing. I think, but um, I I I um, we can all think of times when you know there's been military intervention. You know, in many cases for um, for real or propagandized good good causes that have ended up being far more complicated, far more messy, far more deadlier than anybody imagined. 
Um, you're, it, 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 it's a blunt instrument, uh, and in civil conflicts, uh, you you um, uh, uh, you need uh, you, you, you need to be very, very careful about that. And so, I, I mean, I think it, it just needs to be. Um, I think really, I mean, but also the fact is that when you think of the study of strategic nonviolent action, I mean, how many nonviolent action academies do we have? And how many centers devoted to the study of nonviolent action compared to the study of war? I mean, really, the first serious academic work on strategic nonviolent action came out in 1973. I mean, how many years after Clausewitz or Laozu or, or others, you know? Um, I mean, this field is a, is a relatively new field. And, and, and incidentally, actually, a number of Australians, um, uh, you know, Ralph Summey, Richard Burroughs, Brian Martin, and others have, have, have disproportionately uh, contributed to the field. Um, that I think there really needs to be a lot more serious study uh, of, of, of strategic nonviolent action and, 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 and its application. Um, so I, I, again, I, I um, like I say, I, I don't, I, I can't, I can't say where armed struggle might be necessary, where mil foreign military intervention might be necessary. I know uh, there are probably are situations where they are, but I think in, in, it's, it's, the, 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 the tendency nowadays is to, to I think, rush towards those sooner when I, uh, then, then perhaps, perhaps we should, but that's as, that's as far as I can go. <laughs> Uh, yes, I was just wondering um, if you could comment on the sort of impact that these uprisings and uh, the threat of um, perhaps democratic political governments um, coming up in the Middle East uh, has on Israel? Well, I, I think um, there's... Uh, Israelis seem to be upset about the possibility of losing their much vaunted status as a sole democracy in the Middle East. Um, they, uh, but uh, I, I and, and I mean I think ultimately that um, on the one hand you've had Arab dictators that have used the injustice against the Palestinians uh, as as a distraction from their own uh, 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 the injustice in their own country and the human rights abuses by Israel against the Palestinians as a, and as a way of distracting attention from the human rights abuses uh, that they themselves <laughs> bring against their own people. Um, at the same time, there is genuine, deeply held support for the Palestinians among, um, among Arab peoples and at a, a more representative governments are going to be strongly pro-Palestinian. Um, and I think they'll be pushing harder, harder against Israel. But at the same time, I think they're pragmatic enough you know, not to, to, realize, to think that war is the way. I mean, um, uh, you know, they, um, um, that uh, you know, Egypt lost four wars to Israel pretty badly, and, and uh, Israel's far more powerful to, the, to Egypt now. So again, I, I, don't, I don't see any, any, any desire in that direction. Um, I think that, um, so I, I don't see it as any real, real threat you know, to, to Israel in a sense of any kind of existential uh, threat. Similarly, just let me add, in terms of the United States and other Western countries, I think that um, while the United States and other Western countries may miss some of the friendly dictators, I think in the, the only real threat to the West from the Arab world is from these mega terrorist groups like Al Qaeda, and they're really suffering because of this movement. Uh, the money, the, the, they're, they're not, they're, the intelligence reports saying that new recruits have dried up, money is drying up, a lot of people are leaving because they're saying, hey, we, our, our mode isn't getting anywhere, but look what these people are doing. You know, that, uh, that there's a, that, 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 that um, uh, they're realizing they can't make changes you know, by using their ideology and tactics. Um, even, even, uh, even some, you know, the, uh, Groups like Hamas, uh, which have, have used you know, these acts of terrorism in their in their struggle, uh, when they the the, the, the um, impact from the um, attack on the unarmed humanitarian flotilla <laughs> gave a lot of world attention uh, attention and sympathy to the plight in Hamas, and they realized well, and, and this uh, literally uh, this is a literal quote from a Hamas leader said, "Well, you know, this is more effective than thousands of rockets," and um, we're seeing in the West Bank Palestinians. Uh, using more and more uh, nonviolent action, and when, when 
previously and looked at Palestine, talk about nonviolent action, it was from a handful of you know Christian intellectuals in, in uh, Bethlehem or Ramallah, whatever. But now you're seeing some of the young Tanzim militants and other people who, again, believe in their right to armed resistance against the occupation, but again, believe, seeing the, the, with the gross asymmetry in power, saying this is, this is not, not working. This is just giving Israel an excuse to crack down uh, um, even further, even using it to try to clean up some of the more corrupt officials in Fatah and, and in terms of the areas of, of Palestinian Authority uh, uh, governance. What's also interesting about the Israelis is that, 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 that this scares the hell out of them. And for years they've been scared of nonviolent resistance because it's more effective than, 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 than violence, particularly terrorism. I mean, I remember uh, in the first intifada, the Israelis arrested and jailed and tortured and eventually expelled Mubarak Awad, who was the founder of the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence, uh, who was advocating a nonviolent resistance to occupied territories, while well, they allowed Sheikh Yassin, the founder of Hamas, to run around free, you know, passing out Arabic translations of protocols of the elders of Zion and calling for the destruction of Israel. They didn't, they didn't round him up for another year or so, at least, um, because they knew that people like Mubarak Awad were a bigger threat to the occupation than Sheikh Yassin. You know, that, uh, um, so, you know, the, um, so I think the biggest impact it may have on Israel is not how it might change Arab states' policies towards Israel, but how it might empower the Palestinians, in many cases, cases working uh, in tandem with progressive Israelis who, who oppose the occupation, uh, in, in challenging uh, the, the occupation and forcing uh, a, a, and eventually a new Israeli government to get serious about negotiating for peace. Oh, I'm uh, Harry Frost from RMIT University. Uh, I was wondering, with uh, Western countries uh, taking advantage of some of these oppressed dictatorships, uh, for instance, Australia imports phosphate rock in Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. uh, other European countries uh, use the fisheries in that area. Uh, do you see the lack of uh, policy support from Western nations as a major stumbling block for nonviolent resistance? Well, in the case of Western Sahara, I mean, they, they, you know, since the ceasefire by the Polisario Front in 1991, that was the armed liberation group with Morocco, they did so in return for Morocco allowing for a free and fair referendum on the fate of the territory. And the Moroccans uh, uh, feared, uh, quite uh, um, correctly in my view, that a free and fair referendum would lead to uh, independence instead of integration with Morocco. But because of the uh, Western support from Morocco, uh, they, the uh, United Nations never enforced this mandate, just like Western support uh, prohibited the uh, United Nations from enforcing its resolutions in East Timor. What makes the nonviolent resistance movement, which has sprung up in, in uh, Western Sahara, uh, I mean, they've done some remarkable things. I mean, they, in fact, many, some people, including Noam Chomsky, you know, really say the Arab Spring started in Western Sahara, not Tunisia, because you know, they had 20,000 people, which proportion to the population is like having a million people in Tiger Square, um, you know, in, a, in a, a tent city just outside uh, uh, Al Ayoun, you know, the capital. Uh, it was um, a pro democracy and uh, uh, um, social justice uh, independence uh, protest. It was brutally uh, suppressed, it was bulldozed and burned. A um, number of people were killed. But the, um, you're, you are seeing uh, uh, the, uh, an increasing um, um, nonviolent resistance. The uh, near fatal hunger strike by Ahmed Atu Haidar, the woman who's the most single prominent leader in the nonviolent uh, movement there, and brought unprecedented uh, um, international attention you know, to, the, you know, to the conflict. Um, so, again, so it's important. But the problem with Western Sahara. Is that uh, the Moroccans have moved, the combination of the Moroccans expelling half the population in the initial conquest in 1975, who still live in refugee camps in Algeria to this day, uh, combined with bringing in um, tens of thousands of settlers who now badly outnumber the indigenous Sahrawis, it limits the effectiveness of nonviolent action. For example, you can't have a general strike, you know, when you can just fill in the places with Moroccans who they favor for, an, uh, for employment anyway. Well, that means the real key comes to the international community. And that's what ultimately happened in East Timor. These Timorese could not have done it themselves. Uh, it, it, it came you know, through the, the mass the mobilization of, of civil society, raising awareness about the, the um, um, illegality of the occupation, the, 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 the um, um, human rights abuses. And for those of you who don't know about Western Sahara, a very similar situation to East Timor in that it was a case of late decolonization by a minor colonial power that was promised independence uh, by international community and by the former colonial power, but was instead invaded uh, by the powerful neighbor. In fact, they happened just six weeks apart. 
1975. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and it, was, it, was a, it was a movement uh, in, in support of East Timor, uh, like the, like the uh, Solidarity, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, where, it, where the, 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 the power of global civil society trumped the power of realpolitik uh, of, 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 uh, the, of the dominant uh, countries. Um, the, uh, you know, Australia's role is not as important, say, as uh, France, the United States, you know, permanent members of the Security Council, or, or Spain with the economic interests, or some of the others. But there is still, you know, roles that can be done. You mentioned the phosphates. Um, it can, I, I remember back in, when, when South Africa occupied Namibia, you know, going into these um, uh, uh, grocery stores where they had um, Del Monte sardines that said they're made in South Africa. Well, in fact, they were caught illegally from the fisheries of Namibia. Um, and according to international law, um, that, uh, you know, that you know, uh, profiting from the natural resources of a country under a foreign belligerent occupation, you know, without the proceeds going just to the people themselves, is, is theft. I mean, it's legally theft. And that was also controversial with, with Gareth Evans signing the Timor Gap Agreement with the uh, you know, Indonesians, because this is, East, this is, this is the, uh, the waters of East Timor, not Indonesia. Um, but the, uh, and, and, and in fact, it made Australia the only country in the world that recognized you know, Indonesian sovereignty over, over the occupied country. Well, and, and similarly, you know, the fisheries, the phosphates, other things that are taken from the particular Western Sahara is stolen property by, by, by any, any definition. And so uh, there's a strong, you know, not just moral argument, but legal argument you know, that can be made here, but it's something that you know, people have to, to um, you know, uh, publicize by you know, creative nonviolent action, you know, whether it's putting you know, uh, stickers on products to uh, you know, blockading ports <laughs> where the foxites come in to, you know, uh, to, 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 to whatever. Because even if it's only a small number of people, you know, if it's creative enough, it'll get media coverage and it'll, it'll create a stir. I mean, I remember a, a situation during this, and, and, and when Bangladesh was struggling for independence from Pakistan, you're having hundreds of thousands of, of, of I mean, of, of, of Bengalis being slaughtered. And people, uh, that, that had gotten in the news, this was back in 1971. But what was not known is the United States was secretly arming Pakistan. And, there, and, 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 and a, a, but a group of Quakers in Philadelphia found out that this Pakistani freighter was going into Baltimore Harbor, which was, was, which was not, not, not too far from, from, from Philadelphia, to load open arms. And you had a group of people who blockaded the railroad track that was bringing the, um, the arms you know, to the port. And you had a flotilla of canoes that tried to block this giant Pakistani freighter. Uh, and then the Coast Guard had to come and, 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 and pull up the canoes and grappling hooks. And it was a, a great, it was a media scene. It got on all the national television. But, and they eventually did load the arms. But the publicity from this exposed to an unprecedented degree that the United States was arming Pakistan during the height of the slaughter. And just a few days later, another uh, Pakistani freighter went into Philadelphia. There was another blockade. This time, the dock workers refused to cross the picket line, saying, "We'll not work for blood money," and the ship had to turn around. Um, and this happened a couple places recently, like in Durban, South Africa. A ship of Chinese arms was going to Zimbabwe, and the uh, and trade union in, 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 in Durban they refused to unload it. Had to turn back, and you know, Mozambique and Tanzania, the other ports wouldn't, wouldn't allow them to go in the first place. Um, but 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 you know, these kinds of these kinds of actions. You know, not only uh, you know, can can you know, um, actually uh, you know physically prevent the material from coming in or out or whatever, it can also you know raise awareness of the of the issue, and 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 because I think most people are are I mean the main problem when we're talking about supporting occupations supporting di dictatorships is not that most uh, uh, Australians or Americans or Canadians or, or Brits or anybody else thinks it's a good thing they just don't know about it. And so, you know, so, so the, you know, the publicity that can come from creative nonviolent action, even if it's only a small number of people, can go a long way in raising consciousness and then, and then eventually affecting policy. Um, I just wanted to hark back to the, um, the discussion earlier about dictatorships versus colonial powers and in terms of the situation in Tibet. And I was just want, actually wanting your view on how you think that could change and do you think that has to come from the people of China? Mm -hmm. 